So you've been watching the coverage of measles on the news, and it sounds a lot like this. Urgent new warnings about the spread of measles. A highly contagious and potentially dangerous illness. The number of outbreaks are rising in some parts of the world. And it occurred to me, a lot of us, myself included, have never actually seen a measles case in person before. Because Canada wiped it out more than 25 years ago. So either this is an unfamiliar foe to you, or if you're older, maybe you even had the measles when you were a kid, this is like a bad dream taking you way back in time. So let's cut through it all. Measles is an airborne virus. It gets you sick when you breathe it in. So your mouth, your nose, but even your eyes can be an entry point and it can overrun your lungs. One by one, measles turns your cells into little measles-making factories, and eventually it uses your immune system against you, infecting the very messengers that coordinate your immune response, piggybacking their way through your entire body. The virus actually spreads throughout the entire body. It can range from being a fever rash illness all the way through to it, like a, you require hospitalization, very, very ill problem. That's why a full body rash is one of the most telltale signs that you've got measles. Problem is, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't even actually start there. The earliest symptoms of measles are what doctors call the three C's. So you have cough, measles infects your respiratory tract after all. You have conjunctivitis, which is basically a fancy word for pink eye. So your eyes might get swollen and start leaking a little. Uh, the last C is coryza. Get that O oh, nice and pretty. Uh, that's swelling right here. Basically, you get a stuffy nose, which a lot of people mistakenly think has to do with having too much mucus up there clogging the pipes. But a stuffy nose is actually kind of the reverse of that. You get stuffed up because the pipes get narrower because your nasal tissue is swelling up. Bottom line, it's during these early symptoms where you're most likely to get other people sick. Four days before that rash is supposed to break out and then four days after the rash breaks out. So, you know, we think about uh, nearly eight days where people are really infectious to others. Um, and the scary part of this disease is that um, at least four of those days are without the rash. And we should say, you can still spread the disease even before you start showing any symptom at all. If you're infected, just breathing can be enough to do it. Different diseases spread differently in different populations, but measles is like wildfire anywhere. Measles is, is one of the most transmissible diseases on Earth. We've talked about how measles is an airborne virus, meaning you can spread it by coughing, sneezing, talking, even breathing. But we haven't mentioned how long it survives once you cough or breathe it out. Up to two hours in the air on a surface. For measles, public health recommendations are within two hours of being in the same room. Meaning if I've left the room and someone comes into that room within the next two hours, they're still considered exposed. That fact that measles is so environmentally stable, able to linger in the air, we've seen that happen on a pretty extraordinary scale. Well, I mentioned one in, in a Special Olympics in, uh, in the United States where someone that was uh, essentially at the opening ceremonies you know, on the track um, infected someone that was sitting in the upper deck. So that really just suggests how far and how long and how stable this virus can be at significant distances. So yeah, we looked into that. He's talking about the International Special Olympics in 1991, Minneapolis opening ceremony. This was the study looking into what happened. A track athlete from Argentina was apparently sick. Two spectators who got infected were sitting more than 30 meters above the athlete's entrance in the upper deck of the stands. That's an enormous distance for a virus to travel. Investigators ruled out any other possible exposure. And it's observations like these that contribute to what epidemiologists call the r not value of a disease. Basically, when someone's infected, how many other people are they likely to get sick? r not, you know, a reproductive rate or a reproductive number um, really refers to, you know, in, in general terms, 
how many people are secondarily infected out of an individual being infected. So if I'm infectious today, how many people will acquire measles from my infection from typical exposure? And this is helpful to know because we can essentially boil down every infectious disease to a single number. And I'm gonna show you a few, but just know that the values you'll see are approximations, ranges, cobbled together from a bunch of sources. But pay attention to how each disease compares to the others. So someone infected with Ebola, despite being one of the deadliest diseases on Earth, might only, on average, get a couple of other people sick. Ebola isn't airborne, but diseases like the flu and mumps are. They spread more easily. Some diseases, like HIV, can spread far and wide, in part because people aren't always aware that they're infected. That can go on for months or even years. Then, all the way at the extreme end of the spectrum, you have measles. And if you take that reproduction number at face value, somewhere between 12 and 18, let's just call it 15 on average. So you have your one person who is your source infection. They, you would expect to infect 15 people. Each of those 15 people goes on to infect 15 other people. So you end up with 225 people. Each of those people goes on to infect 15 other people and so on and so forth. It just keeps going. And you can see just how within a few generations of spread, you quickly get thousands of cases. But a few things to bring us back down to reality. One, the rate of spread really does depend on each case. So how much contact does the person have with others? Do they live in a big city or in a small town? What kind of public health resources are in place? But most importantly, we have vaccines. This is a disease that we understand and medically at least have solved, which is why in Canada, for example, at the time I'm recording this, the most recent outbreaks have led to only 17 confirmed cases in the entire country. We've had an effective vaccine against measles since the 1960s. By the 70s, we had the modern MMR vaccine, which protects against measles, mumps, and rubella. By 1998, measles was wiped out in Canada. Canada was actually declared um, uh, free of measles, and the only cases that we have had since then have been related to importation of, of cases. We really don't see local transmission of measles in some countries because vaccine rates are so high, despite it being such an infectious organism. The vaccine is nearly 100% effective, but measles is so contagious, almost everybody needs to be vaccinated in order for a population to have herd immunity. Problem is, we're not quite there. Normally, a kid who turns seven should have had both doses of the MMR vaccine. But in the last few years, the vaccination rate among seven-year-olds really started sliding, dropping below 80%. With the pandemic, we saw this resurgence of misinformation about how the MMR vaccine causes autism. Thoroughly debunked, but believed anyway. And just this week, to give you an example, Montreal Public Health said at some of its schools, the vaccination rate against measles was only 30%. It's easily preventable if everyone is on board. And that's, I think, one of the weak links right now is that vaccination is tailed off for a number of reasons. And that's why we're seeing a global resurgence of this disease. There is apparently no benefit to getting the measles. It doesn't strengthen your immune system. It doesn't do anything that vaccines can't already do, which is to give you immunity to measles. And there's absolutely added risk. You know, most cases of measles are mild. You get cold symptoms, fever, fatigue, you get the blotchy skin, and a few weeks later, you come out the other side. But rarely, measles gets way worse. Um, the measles virus can actually become latent in the brain for some time, and, and people can get a complication decades later that can lead to brain damage. And one of the most insidious things about this disease is how getting sick with measles can actually lead you to get sick with other things. The unique part of this virus is that, you know, you, you get amnesia to other infections that you've been exposed to in the past. Um, and certainly some of those infections may show up in the recovery phase and, and lead to their own complications. Even in healthy individuals, we do see complications of measles that land people in hospital. Um, and, you know, in the global context of the spread that's been occurring over the last uh, decade, we've seen 
complications of measles leading adults to die in, in Western countries with, with adequate healthcare systems. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, most of the world has at least one dose of the vaccine. But with measles, most isn't enough.